Chapter 9 I had a new suit and a small velvet hat. My mother said everyone wears new clothes for the Jewish holidays. It was hot for October, and my father said he remembered it was always hot on the Jewish holidays when he was a kid. I had to wear white gloves. They made my hands sweat. By the time I got to New York, the gloves were pretty dirty, so I took them off and stuffed them into my pocketbook. Grandma met me at our usual spot in the bus terminal and took me in a taxi to her temple. We got there at 10.30. Grandma had to show a card to an usher, and then he led us to our seats, which were in the fifth row in the middle. Grandma whispered to the people sitting near her that I was her granddaughter, Margaret. The people looked at me and smiled. I smiled back. I was glad when the rabbi stepped out on the stage and held up his hands. While this was going on, soft organ music played. I thought it sounded beautiful. The rabbi was dressed in a long black robe. He looked like a priest, except he didn't have on the backwards collar that priests wear. Also, he had a little hat on his head that Grandma called a yarmulke. The rabbi welcomed us and then started a lot of things I didn't understand. We had to stand up and sit down a lot, and sometimes we all read together in English from a prayer book. I didn't understand too much of what I was reading. Other times the choir sang and the organ played. That was definitely the best part. Some of the service was in Hebrew, and I was surprised to see that Grandma could recite along with the rabbi. I looked around a lot to see what was going on, but since I was in the fifth row, there wasn't much for me to see, except the four rows in front of me. I knew it wouldn't be polite to actually turn my head and look behind me. There were two big silver bowls filled with white flowers up on the stage. They were very pretty. At 11.30, the rabbi made a speech, a sermon, Grandma called it. At first, I tried very hard to understand what he was talking about. But after a while, I gave up and started counting different colored hats. I counted eight brown, six black, three red, a yellow, and a leopard before the rabbi finished. Then we all stood up again, and everyone sang a song in Hebrew that I didn't know. And that was it. I expected something else. I don't know what exactly. A feeling, maybe. But I suppose you have to go more than once to know what it's all about. As we filed out of the aisles, Grandma pulled me to one side, away from the crowd. How would you like to meet the rabbi, Margaret? I don't know, I said. I really wanted to get outside. Well, you're going to, Grandma smiled at me. I've told him all about you. We stood in line waiting to shake hands with the rabbi. After a long time, it was our turn. I was face to face with Rabbi Kellerman. He was kind of young and looked a little like Miles J. Benedict Jr. He wasn't skinny, though. Grandma whispered to me, shake hands, Margaret. I held out my hand. This is my granddaughter, Rabbi, the one I told you about, Margaret Simon. The rabbi shook my hand. Yes, of course, Margaret. Good Yom Tov. Yes, I said. The rabbi laughed. It means Happy New Year. That's what we're celebrating today. Oh, I said, well, happy new year to you, ra to you, Rabbi. Did you enjoy our service? He asked. Oh, yes, I said, I just loved it. Good, good. He pumped my hand up and down some more. Come back any time. Get to know us, Margaret. Get to know us and God. I had to go through the third degree when I got home. Well, my mother said, how was it? Okay, I guess. Did you like it? She asked. It was interesting, I said. Did you learn anything? My father wanted to know. Well, I said, in the first five rows, there were eight brown hats and six black ones. My father laughed. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to count feathers on hats. Then we laughed together. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I'm really on my way now. By the end of the school year, I'll know all there is to know about religion. And before I start junior high, I'll know which one I am. 
Then I'll be able to join the Y or the center like everybody else. Chapter 10. Three things happened the first week in November. Laura Danker wore a sweater to school for the first time. Mr. Benedict's eyes almost popped out of his head. Actually, I didn't notice Mr. Benedict's eyes, but Nancy told me. Freddy the Lobster noticed too. He asked me, how come you don't look like that in the sweater, Margaret? Then he laughed hard and slapped his leg. Very funny, I thought. I wore sweaters every day since I had so many of them, all made expressly for me by Grandma. Even if I stuffed my, my bra with socks, I still wouldn't look like Laura Danker. I wondered if it was true that she went behind the A&P with Evan and Moose. Why would she do a stupid thing like that? What reminded me of Moose was that he cut our grass and cleaned up our leaves and said he'd be back in the spring, so unless I bumped into him at Nancy's house, I wouldn't see him all winter. Not that he even knew I existed. I'd had to hide from him ever since that we must, we must incident. But I watched him secretly from my bedroom window. The second thing that happened was that I went to church with Janie Loomis. Janie and I had gotten pretty friendly. We were especially friendly in gym because Ruth, the girl who was second in line, was absent a lot. So Janie and I got to talk, and once I came right out and asked her if she went to church. When I have to, she said. So I asked her if I could go with her sometime just to see what it was like, and she said, sure, how about Sunday? So I, so I went. The funniest thing was it was just like Temple, except it was all in English. But we read from a prayer book that didn't make sense, and the minister gave a sermon I couldn't follow, and I counted eight black hats four red ones, six blue, and two fur. At the end of the service, everyone sang a hymn. Then we stood on line to shake hands with the minister. By then, I was a pro at it. Janie introduced me. This is my friend Margaret Simon. She's no religion. I almost fainted. What did Janie have to go and say that for? The minister looked at me like I was a freak. Then he smiled with an, aha, maybe I'll win her look. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church, Margaret. I hope you'll come back again. Thank you, I said. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I've been to church. I didn't feel anything special in there, God, even though I wanted to. I'm sure it has nothing to do with you. Next time, I'll try harder. During this time, I talked to Nancy every night. My father wanted to know why we had to phone each other so often when we were together in school all day. What can you possibly have to discuss after only three hours, he asked. I didn't even try to explain. Lots of times we did our math homework over the phone. When we were done, Nancy called Gretchen to check answers, and I called Jane. The third thing that happened that week was the principal of our school announced over the loudspeaker that the PTA was giving a Thanksgiving square dance for the three sixth grade classes. Mr. Benedict asked us if we knew how to square dance. Most of us didn't. Nancy told the four PTSs the square dance was going to be really super, and she knew all about it because her mother was on the committee. She said we should all write down who we wanted to dance with, and she'd see what she could do about it. It turned out that we all wanted Philip Leroy, so Nancy said, Forget it. I'm no magician. For the next two weeks, our gym period was devoted to square dancing lessons. Mr. Benedict said if we were being given this party, the least we could do to show our appreciation was to learn to do the basic steps. We practiced with records, and Mr. Benedict jumped around a lot, clapping his hands. When he had to demonstrate a step, he used Laura Danker as his partner. He said it was because she was tall enough to reach his shoulder properly, but Nancy gave me a knowing look. Anyway, none of the boys in our class wanted to be Laura's partner because they were all a lot smaller than her. Even Philip Leroy only came up to her chin, and he was the tallest. The problem with square dance lessons was that most of the boys were a lot more interested in stepping on our feet than they were in learning how to dance, and a few of them were so good at it that they could step on us in time to the music. Mostly, I concentrated on not getting my feet squashed. 
On the morning of the square dance, I dressed in my new skirt and blouse. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I can't wait until two o'clock, God. That's when our dance starts. Do you think I'll get Philip Leroy for a partner? It's not so much that I like him as a person, God, but as a boy, he's very handsome, and I'd love to dance with him, just once or twice. Thank you, God. The PTA decorated the gym. It was supposed to look like a barn, I think. There were two piles of hay and three scarecrows, and a big sign on the wall in yellow letters saying, Welcome to the sixth grade square dance. As if we didn't know. I was glad my mother wasn't a chaperone. It's bad enough trying to act natural at a dance. But when your mother's there, it's impossible. I know because Mrs. Wheeler was a chaperone and Nancy was a wreck. The chaperones were dressed funny, like farmers or something. I mean, Nancy's mother wore dungarees, a plaid shirt, and a big straw hat. I didn't blame Nancy for pretending not to know her. We had a genuine square dance caller. He was dressed up a lot like Mrs. Wheeler. He stood on the stage and told us what steps to do. He also worked the record player. He stamped his feet and jumped around, and now and then I saw him mop his face off with a red handkerchief. Mr. Benedict kept telling us to get into the spirit of the party. Relax and enjoy yourselves, he said. The three sixth grades were supposed to mingle, but the four PTSs stuck close together. We had to line up every time there was a new dance. The girls lined up on one side and the boys on the other. That's how you got a partner. The only trouble was there were four more girls than boys. So whoever wound up last on line had to dance with another leftover girl. That only happened to me and Janie once. Thank goodness. What we did was try to figure out who our partner was going to be in advance. Like, I knew when I was fourth in line that Norman Fishbean was going to be my partner because he was fourth in line on the boys' side. So I switched around fast because Norman Fishbean is the biggest drip in my class. Well, at least one of the biggest drips. Also, Freddie Barnett was to be avoided because all he could do was tease me about how come I didn't look like Laura Danker in a sweater. But I noticed that once when he danced with her, his face was so red, he looked more like a lobster than he did when he was all sunburned. The girls shuffled around more than the boys because most of us wanted to get Philip Leroy for a partner. And finally, I got him. This is how it happened. After everyone had a partner, we had to make a square. My partner was Jay Hassler, who was very polite and didn't try to step on my foot once. Then the caller told us to switch partners with whoever was on our right side. Well, Philip Leroy was with Nancy on my right side, and Nancy was so mad she almost cried right in front of everyone. Even though I was thrilled to have Philip Leroy all to myself for a whole record, he was one of the footsteppers, and dancing with him made my hands sweat so bad I had to wipe them off on my new skirt. At four o'clock, the chaperones served us punch and cookies, and at quarter to five, the dance was over, and my mother picked me up in our new car. My father gave in around Halloween when my mother explained that she couldn't even get a quart of milk because she had no car, and that Margaret couldn't possibly walk to and from school in bad weather, and that bad weather would be coming very soon. My mother didn't like my father's suggestion that if she got up early and drove him to the station, she could use his car all day long. Our new car is a Chevy. It's green. My mother was in a hurry to drive home from the square dance because she was in the middle of a new painting. It was a picture of a lot of different fruits in honor of Thanksgiving. My mother gives away a whole bunch of pictures every Christmas. My father thinks they wind up in other people's attics. Chapter 11. By the first week in December, we no longer used our secret names at PTS meetings. It was too confusing, Nancy said. Also, we just about gave up on our boy books. For one thing, the names never changed. Nancy managed to shift hers around. It was easy for her with 18 boys. But Janie and Gretchen and I always listed Philip Leroy number one. There was no suspense about the whole thing. And I wondered, did they list Philip Leroy because they really liked him? Or were they doing what I did, making him number one because he was so good looking? 
Maybe they were ashamed to write who they really liked, too. The day that Gretchen finally got up the guts to sneak out her father's anatomy book, we met at my house, in my bedroom, with the door closed and a chair shoved in front of it. We sat on the floor in a circle with the book opened to the male body. Do you suppose that's what Philip Leroy looks like without his clothes on? Janie asked. Naturally dope, Nancy said. He's male, isn't he? Look at all those veins and stuff, Janie said. Well, we all have them, Gretchen said. I think they're ugly, Janie said. You better never be a doctor or a nurse, Gretchen told her. They have to look at this stuff all the time. Turn the page, Gretchen, Nancy said. The next page was the male reproductive system. None of us said anything. We just looked until Nancy told us. My brother looks like that. How do you know, I asked. He walks around naked, Nancy said. My father used to walk around naked, Gretchen said, but lately he's stopped doing it. My aunt went to a nudist colony last summer, Janie said. No kidding, Nancy looked up. She stayed a month, Janie told us. My mother didn't talk to her for three weeks after that. She thought it was a disgrace. My aunt's divorced. Because of the nudist colony, I asked. No, Janie said. She was divorced before she went. What do you suppose they do there? Gretchen asked. Just walk around naked is all. My aunt says it's very peaceful, but I'll never walk around naked in front of anybody. What about when you get married? Gretchen asked. Even then, Janie insisted. You're a prude, Nancy said. I am not. It has nothing to do with being a prude. When you grow, you'll change your mind, Nancy told her. You'll want everybody to see you, like those girls in Playboy. What girls in Playboy, Janie asked. Didn't you ever see a copy of Playboy? Where would I see it, Janie asked. My father gets it, I said. Do you have it around, Nancy asked. Sure. Well, get it, Nancy told me. Now, I asked. Of course. Well, I don't know, I said. Listen, Margaret, Gretchen went to all the trouble of sneaking out her father's medical book. The least you could do is show us Playboy. So I opened my bedroom door and went downstairs, trying to remember where I had seen the latest issue. I didn't want to ask my mother, not that it was so wrong to show it to my friends. I mean, if it was so wrong, my father shouldn't get it at all, right? Although lately I think he's been hiding it because it's never in the magazine rack where it used to be. Finally, I found it in his night table drawer, and I thought if my mother caught me and asked me where I was going, I'd say we were making booklets and I needed some old magazines to cut up. But she didn't catch me. Nancy opened it right up to the naked girl in the middle. On the page before, there was a story about her. It said, Hillary Bright is 18 years old. 18? That's only six more years, Nancy squealed. But look at the size of her. They're huge, Janie said. Do you suppose we'll look like that at 18? Gretchen asked. If you ask me, I think there's something wrong with her, I said. She looks out of proportion. Do you suppose that's what Laura Dinker looks like? Janie asked. No, not yet, Nancy said. But she might at 18. Our meeting ended with 50 rounds of, we must, we must, we must increase our bust. Chapter 12. On December 11th, Grandma sailed on a three-week cruise to the Caribbean. She went every year. She had a bone voyage party in her room on the ship. This year, I was allowed to go. My mother gave Grandma a green silk box to keep her jewelry safe. It was very nice, all lined in white velvet. Grandma said thank you and that all her jewelry was for her Margaret anyway, so she had to take good care of it. Grandma's always reminding me of how nobody lives forever and everything she has is for me, and I hate it when she talks like that. She once told me she had her lawyer prepare her funeral instructions so things would go the way she planned, such as the kind of box she wants to be buried in, and that she doesn't want any speeches at all, and that I should only come once or twice a year to see that her grave is looking nice and neat. We stayed on the ship half an hour, and then Grandma kissed me goodbye and promised to take me along with her one of these days. 
The next week, my mother started to address her Christmas cards, and for days at a time, she was frantically busy with them. She doesn't call them Christmas cards. Holiday greetings, she says. We don't celebrate Christmas exactly. We give presents, but my parents say that's a traditional American custom. My father says my mother and her greeting cards have to do with her childhood. She sends them to people she grew up with, and they send cards back to her. So once a year, she finds out who married whom and who had what kids and stuff like that. Also, she sends one to her brother, whom I've never met. He lives in California. This year, I discovered something really strange. I discovered that my mother was sending a Christmas card to her parents in Ohio. I found out because I was looking through the pile of cards one day when I had a cold and stayed home from school. There it was, just like that. The envelope said Mr. and Mrs. Paul Hutchins, and that's them. My grandparents. I didn't mention anything about it to my mother. I had the feeling I wasn't supposed to know. In school, Mr. Benedict was running around trying to find out what happened to the new choir robes. The whole school was putting on a Christmas Hanukkah pageant for the parents, and our sixth grade class was the choir. We didn't even have to try out. Mr. Benedict's class will be the choir, the principal announced. We practiced singing every day with the music teacher. I thought by the time Christmas finally rolled around, I wouldn't have any voice left. We learned five Christmas carols and three Hanukkah songs, alto and soprano parts. Mostly the boys sang alto and the girls sang soprano. We'd been measured for our new choir robes right after Thanksgiving. The PTA decided the old ones were really worn out. Our new ones would be green instead of black. We all had to carry pencil-sized flashlights instead of candles. We practiced marching down the halls and into the auditorium singing Adeste Fidelis in English and Latin. We marched in two lines, boys and girls, and naturally in size places. I walked right behind Janie because Ruth had moved away. My partner turned out to be Norman Fishbean. I never looked at him. I just marched looking straight ahead, singing very loud. A week before the pageant, Alan Gordon told Mr. Benedict that he wasn't going to sing the Christmas songs because it was against his religion. Then Lisa Murphy raised her hand and said that she wasn't going to sing the Hanukkah songs because it was against her religion. Mr. Benedict explained that songs were for everyone and had nothing at all to do with religion. But the next day, Alan brought in a note from home, and from then on, he marched, but he didn't sing. Lisa sang when we marched, but she didn't even move her lips during the Hanukkah songs. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I want you to know I'm giving a lot of thought to Christmas and Hanukkah this year. I'm trying to decide if one might be special for me. I'm really thinking hard, God, but so far I haven't come up with any answers. Our new green choir robes were delivered to school the day before the pageant and were sent home with us to be pressed. The best thing about the pageant, besides wearing the robe and carrying the flashlight, was that I got to sit in the first row of choir seats, facing the audience, which meant that the kindergarten kids were right in front of me. Some of them tried to touch our feet with their feet. One little kid wet his pants during the scene where Mary and Joseph come to the inn. He made a puddle on the floor right in front of Janie. Janie had to keep on singing and pretend she didn't know. It was pretty hard not to laugh. School closed for vacation right after the pageant. When I got home, my mother told me I had a letter. Chapter 13 Margaret, you've got a letter, my mother called from the studio. It's on the front table. I just about never get any letters, probably because I never write anybody back. So I dashed over to the front table and picked it up. Miss Margaret Simon, it said. I turned the envelope around, but there was no return address. I wondered who sent it. Wondering made it much more fun than ripping it open and knowing right away. It was probably just an advertisement anyway. Finally, when I couldn't stand it any more, I opened it, very slowly and very carefully, so I wouldn't rip up the envelope. It was an invitation. I knew right away because of the picture a bunch of kids dancing around a record. Also, it said, having a party. Who's having a party, I thought. Who's having a party and invited me? 
Naturally, I could have found out right away. I could have looked inside, but this was better. I considered the possibilities. It couldn't be a PTS because I would have known. It could be somebody I knew from New York for camp, except I hadn't written to any old friends to tell them my new address. Anyway, the envelope was postmarked, New Jersey. Let's see, I thought, who could it be? Who? Finally, I opened it. Come on over on Saturday, December 20th, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Supper, 1334 Whittingham Terrace, Norman Fishbean. Norman Fishbean, I yelled. That drip? I never even talked to him. Why would he invite me to his party? Still, a party is a party, and for supper, too. Hey, Mom, I yelled, running into the studio. My mother was standing away from her canvas, studying her work. Her paintbrush was in her mouth, between her teeth. Guess what, Mom? What, she said, not taking the paintbrush away. I'm invited to a supper party. Here, look. I showed her my invitation. She read it. Who's Norman Fishbean? She took the paintbrush out of her mouth. A kid in my class. Do you like him? He's okay. Can I go? Well, I suppose so. My mother dabbed some red paint on her canvas. Then the phone rang. I'll get it. I ran into the kitchen and said a breathless hello. It's Nancy. Did you get invited? Yes, I said. Did you? Mm, we all did. Janie and Gretchen, too. Can you go? Sure. Me, too. I've never been to a supper party, Nancy said. Me, either. Should we dress up? I asked. My mother's going to call Mrs. Fishbean. I'll let you know. She hung up. Ten minutes later, the phone rang again. I answered. Margaret, it's me again. I know. You'll never believe this, Nancy said. What? What won't I believe? We're all invited. What do you mean all? Our whole class. All 28 of us? That's what Mrs. Fishbean told my mother. Even Laura? I guess so. Do you think she'll come, I asked, trying to picture Laura at a party. Well, her mother and Mrs. Fishbean work on a lot of committees together, so maybe her mother will make her. How about Philip Leroy? He's invited, that's all I know, and Mrs. Fishbean said definitely party clothes. When I hung up, I raced back to the studio. Mom, our whole class is invited. Your whole class? My mother put her paintbrush down and looked at me. Yes, all 28 of us. Mrs. Fishbean must be crazy, my mother said. Should I wear my velvet, do you think? It's your best. You might as well. On the day of the party, I talked to Nancy six times, to Janie three times, and to Gretchen twice. Nancy called me back every time she changed her mind about what to wear, and each time she asked me if I was still wearing my velvet. I told her I was. The rest of the time, we made our arrangements. We decided that Nancy would sleep over at my house and that Gretchen would sleep over at Janie's. Mr. Wheeler would drive us all to the party, and Mr. Loomis would drive us home. My mother washed my hair at 2 o'clock. She gave me a cream rinse, too, so I wouldn't get tangles. She set it in big rollers all over my head. I sat under her hairdryer. Then she filed my nails with an emery board instead of just cutting them like usual. My velvet dress was already laid out on my bed, along with my new underwear, party shoes, and tights. My new underwear was not the ordinary cotton kind. It was nylon, trimmed with lace around the edges. It was supposed to be one of my December tradition gifts. All afternoon, I kept thinking that maybe Norman Fishbean wasn't such a drip. After my bath, I was supposed to go to my room and rest so I'd be in good shape for the party. I went to my room and closed the door, only I didn't feel like resting. What I did was move my desk chair in front of my dresser mirror. Then I stood on the chair and took off my robe. I stood naked in front of the mirror. I was starting to get some hairs. I turned around and studied myself sideways. Then I got off the chair and moved it closer to the mirror. I stood back up on it and looked again. My head looked funny with all those rollers. The rest of me looked the same. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I hate to remind you, God. I mean, I know you're busy, but it's already December and I'm not growing. At least, I don't see any real difference. Isn't it time, God? Don't you think I've waited patiently? Please help me. 
I hopped off the chair and sat down on the edge of my bed, putting on my clean underwear and tights. Then I stood in front of my mirror again. I didn't look at myself for a very long, for very long this time. I went into the bathroom and opened the bottom cabinet. There was a whole box of cotton balls. Sterile until opened, the package said. I reached in and grabbed a few. My heart was pounding, which seemed stupid because what was I so afraid of anyway? I mean, if my mother saw me grab some cotton balls, she wouldn't say anything. I used them all the time to put calamine on my summer mosquito bites, to clean off cuts and bruises, to put on my face lotion at night. But my heart kept pounding anyway because I knew what I was going to do with the cotton balls. I tiptoed back to my room and closed the door. I stepped into my closet and stood in one corner. I shoved three cotton balls into each side of my bra. Well, so what if it was cheating? Probably other girls did it too. I'd look a lot better, wouldn't I? So why not? I came out of the closet and got back up on my chair. This time when I turned sideways, I looked like I'd grown. I liked it. Are you still there, God? See how nice my bra looks now? That's all I need, just a little help. I'll really be good around the house, God. I'll clear the table every night for a month at least. Please, God. Chapter 14. Later, my mother brushed my hair. It came out just right, except for one piece on the left that turned the wrong way. My mother said that piece made it look very natural. My mother and father smiled at me a lot while I was waiting for Nancy's father to pick me up. I smiled back. It was like we all knew some special secret. Only I knew they didn't know my special secret. At least they didn't say anything dumb like, doesn't she look sweet? Going to her first supper party. Ugh, I'd have died. Mr. Wheeler tooted his horn at quarter to five. My mother kissed me goodbye and my father waved from his chair. Have fun, he called. The four PTSs squeezed into the back seat of the Wheeler car, not the station wagon. Nancy's father told us it was silly to sit like that. And besides, it made him feel like a hired chauffeur. But all we did was giggle. Jamie got her hair cut without telling us she was going to. She said she didn't know it herself until that afternoon when her mother took her to the beauty parlor and had a private talk with Mr. Anthony. Then Mr. Anthony started clipping away, and next thing she knew, she had this new haircut. She looked like an elf. It did a lot for her. And for a minute, I thought about how I would look with the same haircut. But then I remembered how long I'd been suffering to let my hair grow. I decided it would be stupid to cut it all off. When we got to the party, Norman's mother opened the door for us. She was very tall and thin with a face like Norman's. I remembered her from the PTA square dance. Tonight, she wasn't dressed like a farmer. She had on black velvet pants and some kind of top that looked like it had diamonds and rubies all over it. Good evening, Mrs. Fishbean, Nancy said in a voice I'd never heard. Please meet my friend, Margaret Simon. Mrs. Fishbean smiled at me and said, Glad to meet you, Margaret. Then she took our coats away and handed them to a maid who carried them up the stairs. My, you all look so pretty, Mrs. Fishbean said. Everyone is downstairs. Nancy, you know the way. I followed Nancy past the living room. The furniture was all very modern. The chairs looked like carved out boxes and the tables were all glass. Everything was beige. At Nancy's house, the furniture all has lion's paws for feet, and there are a million colors. At my house, the living room is carpeted but empty. My mother is trying to decide what kind of stuff she wants. Norman's house was pretty big because I had to follow Nancy through at least four more rooms before we got to a door leading downstairs. It looked like most of my class was already there including Laura Danker, who I thought looked gorgeous in a soft pink dress with her hair all loose, kind of hanging in her face. The boys had on sports jackets and some wore ties. Philip Leroy had on a tie the first time I saw him, but a few minutes later, the tie was gone and his shirt was unbuttoned around the neck. Soon after that, not one boy had his jacket on. They were all in a big heap in the corner. Mostly, the girls stayed on one side of the room and the boys on the other. As soon as everyone was there, Mrs. Fishbean brought out the food. 
all kinds of sandwiches and a big dish of cut up hot dogs and beans. I took some of that and some potato salad and sat down at a table with Janie, Nancy, and Gretchen. There were six little tables, so practically everyone had a place to sit. As soon as we were all served, Mrs. Fishbean and the maid went back upstairs. I'm not sure who started blowing the mustard through a straw up at the ceiling. I only know that I saw Philip Leroy yell, Watch this, Freddy, as he aimed his straw. I saw the mustard fly up and make a yellow splotch on the white ceiling. Mrs. Fishbean didn't come downstairs again until dessert time. At first, she didn't see the ceiling, but she did see the mess in the buffet table. When she looked up, she sucked in her breath, and the room got very quiet. What is that on my ceiling? she asked Norman. Mustard, Norman answered. I see, Mrs. Fishbean replied. That was all she said, but she looked at every one of us with an I don't know why your parents never taught you any manners look. Then Mrs. Fishbean stood close to our table and said, I'm sure these girls aren't responsible for this mess. We smiled at her, but I saw Philip Lever stick out his tongue at us. Now I'm going upstairs to get your dessert, Mrs. Fishbean said, and I expect you to behave like ladies and gentlemen. Dessert was tiny cupcakes in all different colors. I ate two chocolate ones before Freddie Barnett came over to our table. I'm sure these girls didn't do anything naughty, he mimicked. These girls are so sweet and good. Oh, shut up, Nancy told him, standing up. She was as tall as he was. Why don't you shut up, know it all? Cut it out, lobster, Nancy hollered. Who's a lobster? You are, Nancy gritted her teeth. Freddy grabbed hold of Nancy, and for a minute I thought he was going to hit her. Take your lobster claws off me, Nancy yelled. Make me. Freddie told her. Nancy whirled around, but Freddie had hold of her dress by the pocket, and next thing we knew, Freddie still had the pocket, but Nancy was across the room. Oh, he ripped off my pocket, Nancy screamed. Freddie looked like he couldn't believe it himself, but there he was, holding Nancy's pocket. There wasn't any hole in Nancy's dress, just some loose threads where her pocket used to be. Nancy ran up the stairs and returned a few minutes later with Mrs. Fishbean. He tore off my pocket, Nancy said, pointing to Freddie Barnett. I didn't mean to, Freddie explained. It just came off. I am shocked at your behavior. Simply shocked, Mrs. Fishbean said. I don't know what kind of children you are. I'm not going to send you home because your parents expect you to be here until nine and it's only seven now. But I'm telling you this, any more hanky-panky and I'll call each and every one of your mothers and fathers and report this abominable behavior to them. Mrs. Fishbean marched back up the stairs. We couldn't hold back our giggles. It was all so funny, hanky-panky and abominable. Even Nancy and Freddie had to laugh. Then Norman suggested that we play games to keep out of trouble. The first game is guess who, Norman said. Guess who, Janie asked. How do you play that? Norman explained. See, I turn off all the lights and the boys line up on one side and the girls on the other. And then when I yell go, the boys run to the girls' side and try to guess who's who by the way they feel. No, thank you, Gretchen said. That's disgusting. Above the neck, Gretchen, Norman said. Only above the neck. Forget it. Gretchen said, and we all agreed. Especially me. I kept thinking of those six cotton balls. They weren't so far below my neck. Okay, Norman said. We'll start with spin the bottle. That's corny, Philip Leroy shouted. Yeah, the other boys agreed. We have to start with something, Norman said. He put a green bottle on the floor. We sat in a big circle around the green bottle. Norman told us his rules. You gotta kiss whoever's nearest to where the bottle points. No fair boy kissing boy or girl kissing girl. Norman spun first. He got Janie. He bent down and gave her a kiss on the cheek, near her ear, but up higher. He ran back to his place in the circle. Everybody laughed. Then Janie had to spin. She got Jay. She put her face next to his, but she kissed the air instead of him. No fair, Norman called out. You've got to really kiss him. Okay, okay, Janie said. She tried again. She made it this time, but far away from his mouth. 
I felt a lot safer knowing it would all be cheek kissing. I held my breath every time somebody turned the bottle, waiting to see who would get me and wondering who I would get. When Gretchen got Philip Leroy, she could hardly stand up. She kept biting her lip and finally she went over to him and gave him the quickest kiss you ever saw. Then I really couldn't breathe because I thought, if he gets me, I'll faint. I closed my eyes. When I opened them, I saw the bottle pointing straight at Laura Danker. She looked down and when Philip bent to kiss her, I think all he got was her forehead and some loose hair. That's when Jay said, this is really stupid. Let's play two minutes in the closet. What's that? Norman asked. Jay explained. We all get a number and then somebody starts by calling like number six. And those two go in the closet for two minutes and, uh, well, you know. We don't have a closet down here, Norman said, but we do have a bathroom. Norman didn't waste any time getting some paper and pencils. He scribbled the numbers on a big sheet of paper, odd ones for the boys, evens for the girls. Then he tore each number off and put first the evens, then the odds in his father's hat. We all picked. I got number 12. I was half scared and half excited, and I wished I had been experimenting like Nancy. Nancy would know what to do with a boy in the dark, but what did I know? Nothing. Norman said he'd go first because it was his party. Nobody argued. He stood up and cleared his throat. Number, uh, <clears throat> Number 16, he said. Gretchen squealed and jumped up. Bye-bye, you two, Nancy said. Don't be long. Long? They were back in three seconds. Hey, I thought you said two minutes, Philip Leroy called. Two minutes is as long as you can stay, Norman said, but you don't have to stay that long if you don't want to. Gretchen called number three, which was Freddie Barnett, and I hoped I'd remember to never call number three. Then Freddie called number 14 and got Laura Danker. We all giggled. I wondered how he would kiss her because I didn't think he could reach her face unless he stood on something. Maybe he'll stand on the toilet seat, I thought. And then I couldn't stop laughing at all. When they came out of the bathroom, Laura's face was as red as Freddie's, and I thought that was pretty funny for a girl who goes behind the A&P with boys. Laura called her number very softly. Seven, she said. Philip Leroy stood up and smiled at the boys. He pushed his hair off his face and walked to the bathroom with his hands stuffed in his pockets. I kept thinking that if he really liked her, he'd call her number back and the two of them would be in the bathroom together for the rest of the party. When they came out, Philip was still smiling, but Laura wasn't. Nancy poked me and gave me her knowing look. I was so busy watching Laura that I didn't hear Philip call number 12. Who's 12? Philip asked. Somebody must be 12. Did you say 12? I asked. That's me. Well, come on, Margaret. I stood up knowing I'd never be able to make it across the recreation room to the bathroom where Philip Leroy was waiting to kiss me. I saw Janie, Gretchen, and Nancy smiling at me, but I couldn't smile back. I don't know how I got to the bathroom. All I know is I stepped in and Philip shut the door. It was hard to see anything. Hi, Margaret, he said. Hi, Philip, I whispered. Then I started to giggle. I can't kiss you if you don't stop laughing, he said. And why not? Because your mouth is open when you laugh. You're going to kiss me on the mouth? You know a better place? I stopped laughing. I wished I could remember what Nancy said that day she showed me how to kiss her pillow. Stand still, Margaret, Philip told me. I stood still. He put his hands on my shoulders and leaned close. Then he kissed me. A really fast kiss. Not the kind you see in the movies where the boy and girl cling together for a long time. While I was thinking about it, Philip kissed me again. Then he opened the bathroom door and walked back to his place. Call a number, Margaret, Norman said. Hurry up. I couldn't even think of a number. I wanted to call Philip Leroy's number, but I couldn't remember it. So I called number nine and got Norman Fishbean. He was really proud, like I'd picked him on purpose. Ha! He practically ran to the bathroom. After he closed the door, he said, I really like you, Margaret. How do you want me to kiss you? On the cheek and fast, I said. He did it just that way, and I quickly opened the door and walked away from the bathroom. And that was it.
Later, at my house, Nancy told me she thought I was the luckiest girl in the world, and maybe it was fate that brought me and Philip Leroy together. Did he kiss good, she asked. Pretty good, I said. How many times, she asked. About five. I lost count, I told her. Did he say anything? Nothing much. Do you still like him? Of course. Me too. Good night, Nancy. Good night, Margaret. Chapter 15 I went to Christmas Eve services with the Wheelers at the United Methodist Church of Farbrook. I asked Nancy if I had to meet the minister. Are you kidding, she said. The place will be mobbed. He doesn't even know my name. I relaxed after that and enjoyed most of the service, especially since there wasn't any sermon. The choir sang for 45 minutes instead. I got home close to midnight. I was so tired my parents didn't question me. I fell into bed without brushing my teeth. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. I just came home from church. I loved the choir. The songs were so beautiful. Still, I didn't really feel you, God. I'm more confused than ever. I'm trying hard to understand, but I wish you'd help me a little. If only you could give me a hint, God. Which religion should I be? Sometimes I wish I'd been born one way or the other. Grandma came back from her cruise in time to pack up and head for Florida. She said New York had nothing to offer since I was gone. She sent me two postcards a week, called every Friday night, and promised to be home before Easter. Our phone conversations were always the same. I talked first. Hello, Grandma. Yes, I'm fine. They're fine. School's fine. I miss you, too. Then my father talked. Hello, Mother. Yes, we're fine. How's the weather down there? Well, it's bound to come out sooner or later. That's why they call it the Sunshine State. Then my mother talked. Hello, Sylvia. Yes, Margaret's really fine. Of course, I'm sure. Okay, and you take care, too. Then I talked a second time. Bye, Grandma. See you soon. During the second week in January, Mr. Benedict announced that the sixth grade girls were going to see a movie on Friday afternoon. The sixth grade boys were not going to see the movie. At that time, they would have a discussion with the boys' gym teacher from the junior high. Nancy passed me a note. It said, here we go, the big deal sex movie. When I asked her about it, she told me the PTA sponsors it, and it's called What Every Girl Should Know. When I went home, I told my mother, we're going to see a movie in school on Friday. I know, my mother said. I got a letter in the mail. It's about menstruation. I already know all about that. I know you know, my mother said, but it's important for all the girls to see it in case their mothers haven't told them the facts. Oh. On Friday morning, there was a lot of giggling. Finally, at two o'clock, the girls lined up and went to the auditorium. We took up the first three rows of seats. There was a lady on the stage dressed in a gray suit. She had a big behind. Also, she wore a hat. Hello, girls, she said. She clutched a hanky, which she waved at us sometimes. I'm here today to tell you about what every girl should know, brought to you as a courtesy of the private lady company. We'll talk some more after the film. Her voice was smooth, like a radio announcer's. Then the lights went out and we saw the movie. The narrator of the film pronounced it menstruation. Remember, the voice said, it's menstruation. Gretchen, who was next to me, gave me a kick and I kicked Nancy on the other side. We held our hands over our mouths so we wouldn't laugh. The film told us about the ovaries and explained why girls menstruate, but it didn't tell us how it feels, except to say that it is not painful, which we knew anyway. Also, it didn't really show a girl getting it. It just said how wonderful nature was and how we would soon become women and all that. After the film, the lady in the gray suit asked if there were any questions. 
Nancy raised her hand, and when Grace Suit called on her, Nancy said, How about Tampax? Grace Suit coughed into her hanky and said, We don't advise internal protection until you are considerably older. Then Grey Suit came down from the stage and passed out booklets called What Every Girl Should Know. The booklet recommended that we use private lady sanitary supplies. It was like one big commercial. I made a mental note never to buy private lady things when and if I ever needed them. For days after that, whenever I looked at Gretchen, Janie, or Nancy, we'd pretend to be saying menstruation. We laughed a lot. Mr. Benedict told us we'd have to settle down since we had a lot to learn before we'd be ready for seventh grade. One week later, Gretchen got it. We had a special PTS meeting that afternoon. I got it last night. Can you tell? She asked us. Oh, Gretchen, you lucky, Nancy shrieked. I was sure I'd be first. I've got more than you. Well, that doesn't mean much, Gretchen said knowingly. How did it happen? I asked. Well, I was sitting there eating my supper when I felt like something was dripping from me. Go on, go on, Nancy said. Well, I ran to the bathroom, and when I saw what it was, I called my mother. And? I asked. She yelled that she was eating. And? Janie said. Well, I yelled back that it was important. So, so, Nancy prompted. So, uh, she came and I showed her, Gretchen said. Then what? Janie asked. Well, she didn't have any stuff in the house. She uses Tampax herself, so she had to call the drugstore and order some pads. What'd you do in the meantime? Janie asked. Kept a washcloth in my pants, Gretchen said. Oh, you didn't, Nancy said, laughing. Well, I had to, Gretchen said. Okay, so then what? I asked. Well, in about an hour, the stuff came from the drugstore. Then what? Nancy asked. My mother showed me how to attach the pad to the belt. Oh, you know. Nancy was mad. Look, Gretchen, did we or did we not make a deal to tell each other absolutely everything about getting it? I'm telling you, aren't I? Gretchen asked. Not enough, Nancy said. What's it feel like? Mostly, I don't feel anything. Sometimes it feels like it's dripping. It doesn't hurt coming out, but I had some cramps last night. Bad ones? Janie asked. Not bad, just different, Gretchen said. Lower down and across my back. Does it make you feel older? I asked. Naturally, Gretchen answered. My mother said now I'll really have to watch what I eat because I've gained too much weight this year. And she said to wash my face well from now on with soap. And that's it, Nancy said. The whole story? I'm sorry if I've disappointed you, Nancy, but really that's all there is to tell. Oh, one thing I forgot. My mother said I may not get it every month yet. Sometimes it takes a while to get regular. Are you using that private lady stuff? I asked. No, the drugstore sent teenage softies. Well, I guess I'll be next, Nancy said. Janie and I looked at each other. We guessed so, too. When I went home, I told my mother, Gretchen Potter got her period. Did she really? My mother asked. Yes, I said. I guess she'll begin soon, too. How old were you, Mom, when you got it? Uh, I think I was 14. 14? That's crazy. I'm not waiting until I'm 14. I'm afraid there's not much you can do about it, Margaret. Some girls menstruate earlier than others. I had a cousin who was 16 before she started. Do you suppose that could happen to me? I'll die if it does. If you don't start by the time you're 14, I'll take you to the doctor. Now stop worrying. How can I stop worrying when I don't know if I'm going to turn out normal? I promise you'll turn out normal. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Gretchen, my friend, got her period. I'm so jealous, God. I hate myself for being so jealous, but I am. I wish you'd help me just a little. Nancy's sure she's going to get it soon, too. And if I'm last, I don't know what I'll do. Oh, please, God, I just want to be normal. 
Nancy and her family went to Washington over Lincoln's birthday weekend. I got a postcard from her before she got back, which means she must have mailed it the second she got there. It only had three words on it. I got it. I ripped the card into tiny shreds and ran to my room. There was something wrong with me. I just knew it, and there wasn't a thing I could do about it. I flopped into my bed and cried. Next week, Nancy would want to tell me all about her period and about how grown up she was. Well, I didn't want to hear her good news. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Life is getting worse every day. I'm going to be the only one who doesn't get it. I know it, God. Just like I'm the only one without a religion. Why can't you help me? Haven't I always done what you wanted? Please, let me be like everybody else. Chapter 16 My mother took me to Lincoln Center twice. We used Grandma's subscription tickets. It wasn't as much fun as with Grandma, because number one, I didn't get to ride the bus alone, and number two, my mother thought the concert itself was more important than looking at the people. I wrote Grandma a letter. Dear Grandma, I miss you. Florida sure sounds like fun. School is fine. So are Mom and Dad. I am fine, too. I've only had one cold so far and two viruses. One was the throwing up kind. I forgot to tell you this over the phone, but when we, when we went to Lincoln Center, there was slush all over the place, so I couldn't sit by the fountain. I had to wear boots, too, and my feet sweated during the concert. Mom wouldn't let me take them off, the way you do. It snowed again yesterday. I'll bet you don't miss that, do you? But snow is more fun in New Jersey than in New York. For one thing, it's cleaner. Love, Margaret. Grandma wrote back, Dear Margaret, I miss you too. Thank you for your nice letter. I hope when you were sick, your mother took you to a good doctor. If I had been home, I would have asked Dr. Cohen who he recommends in New Jersey. There must be one or two good doctors there. You probably caught cold because you kept your boots on at Lincoln Center. Your mother should know better. From now on, take off your boots the way we always do, no matter what your mother says. Only don't tell her I said so. I met a very nice man at my hotel. His name is Mr. Benjamin. He comes from New York, too. We have dinner together and sometimes see a show. He is a widower with three children, all married. They think he should get married again. He thinks he should get married again, but I'm not saying anything. I hope your mother and father will let you come stay with me during spring vacation. Would you like that? I'm writing a letter to ask their permission. Be careful and dress warmly. Write to me again. All my love, Grandma. Dear Grandma, Mom and Dad say I can probably visit you during spring vacation, but that it's too soon to make definite plans. I'm so excited I could die. I'm counting the days already. I've never been on a plane, as you know, and Florida sounds like so much fun. Also, I want to see what's going on with you and that Mr. Benjamin. You never tell us a thing when you call. I am fine. The snow melted. Mom is painting a new picture. This one is of apricots, grapes, and ivy leaves. Did I tell you my friends Nancy and Gretchen got their periods? See you soon, I hope. Love and kisses, Margaret. Chapter 17 on the first Sunday in March, Nancy invited me to spend the day in New York with her family. Evan brought Moose. It was pretty exciting riding all the way to the city with Moose freed in the same car, except the wheelers used their station wagon. The boys sat in the back, and Nancy and I were in the middle, so if I wanted to see Moose, I had to turn around, and if I ride looking backwards like that, I get car sick. We went to Radio City Music Hall. Grandma used to take me there when I was little. My parents always say it's strictly for the tourists. I wanted to sit next to Moose, but he and Evan found two seats off by themselves. After the show, the wheelers took us to the steak place for dinner. Nancy and I ordered, then excused ourselves to go to the ladies' room. We were the only two in there, which was lucky for us because there were only two toilets and we both had to go pretty bad. Just as I was finishing up, I heard Nancy moan, Oh, no. Oh, no. What is it, Nancy? I asked. Oh, please. Oh, no. Are you okay? 
I banged on the wall, separating us. Get my mother, quick, she whispered. I stood in front of her booth then. What's wrong? I tried the door, but it was locked. Let me in. Nancy started to cry. Please get my mother. Okay, I'm going. I'll be right back. I raced to our table in the dining room, hoping Nancy wouldn't faint or anything like that before I got back with her mother. I whispered to Mrs. Wheeler, Nancy's sick. She's in the bathroom crying and she wants you. Mrs. Wheeler jumped up and followed me back to the ladies' room. I could hear Nancy sobbing. Nancy, Mrs. Wheeler called, trying the door. Oh, Mom, I'm so scared. Help me, please. The door's locked, Nancy. I can't get in, Mrs. Wheeler said. You've got to unlock it. I can't, I can't, Nancy cried. I could crawl under and open it from the other side, I suggested. Should I? I asked Mrs. Wheeler. She nodded. I gathered my skirt around my legs so it wouldn't drag on the floor and crawled under the door. Nancy's face was buried in her hands. I unlocked the door for Mrs. Wheeler, then waited outside by the sinks. I wondered if Nancy would have to go to the hospital or what. I hoped she didn't have anything catching. In a few minutes, Mrs. Wheeler opened the door crack and handed me some change. Margaret, she said, would you get us a sanitary napkin, please? I must have given her a strange look because she said, from the dispenser on the wall, dear, Nancy's minstrel. Does she always act like that? It's her first time, Mrs. Wheeler explained. She's frightened. Nancy was still crying, and there was a lot of whispering going on. I couldn't believe it. Nancy, who knew everything. She'd lied to me about her period. She'd never had it before. I put the change into the machine and pulled the lever. The sanitary napkin popped out in a cardboard box. I handed it to Mrs. Wheeler. Nancy, calm down, I heard her mother say. I can't help you if you don't stop crying. Suppose I hadn't been along that day. I'd never have found out about Nancy. I almost wished I hadn't. Finally, Nancy and her mother came out of the booth, and Mrs. Wheeler suggested that Nancy wash up before coming back to the table. I'm going to tell the others not to worry, she said. Don't be too long, girls. I didn't know what to say. I mean... What can you say when you've just found out your friend's a liar? Nancy washed her hands and face. I handed her two paper towels to dry herself. Are you okay? I asked. I felt kind of sorry for Nancy then. I want my period too, but not enough to lie about it. Nancy faced me. Margaret, please don't tell. Oh, Nancy, I mean it. I die if the others knew. Promise you won't tell about me, she begged. I won't. I thought I had at that time. You know, I didn't just make it all up. It was a mistake. Okay, I said. You won't tell? I said I wouldn't. We walked back to the table and joined the others for dinner. Our steaks were just being served. I sat next to Moose. He smelled very nice. I wondered if he shaved because the nice smell reminded me of my father's aftershave lotion. I got to touch his hand a couple of times because he was a lefty and I'm a righty, so now and then we'd bump. He said he always has that trouble at round tables. He was definitely number one in my boy book, even if nobody knew it but me. I could only finish half of my steak. The wheelers took the other half home in a doggy bag. I knew they didn't have a dog, but naturally I didn't tell the waitress. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Nancy Wheeler is a big fake. She makes up stories. I'll never be able to trust her again. I will wait to find out from you if I am normal or not. If you would like to give me a sign, fine. If not, I'll try to be patient. All I ask is that I don't get it in school, because if I had to tell Mr. Benedict, I know I would die. Thank you, God.